I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the term posers. I don't hear it that much anymore. Um, where did we come up with posers? I think it was like a thing from the skateboard days when I was a kid, when, you know, my buddy would have like the Tony Hawk and I had the Steve Caballero and we were on the half pipe. And there was always that one kid that wouldn't ride the pipe. He would just kind of stand there posing with his board and his pads. Um, sometimes his mom would come around and take pictures with him with a little snap camera or you roll it sort of thing. But he had all the gear, you know, the clothing, and he would just kind of pose. All right. Not a big deal. He was scared maybe. Who knows? But these guys, uh, you know, they show up a few other times in life. Now, the weird thing is, is after about the high school years, 20 or so, I didn't really come across a lot of posers, frauds, clout chasers, and fakers. Um, I'm trying to think of the major epochs. So if I were to break it down, major epochs in life for me after 20 would have been the uh, credit collection years, which was about 20 to 30. Um, 30 on, I was deeply involved in uh, entrepreneurs organization, building my business uh, through the hyper growth years and everything that we did. Uh, so it'd be one, two, three, I would say about three. And then the fourth one would be what I'm doing with entrepreneurs and cars, right? Yeah. Surfing also refers to posers. I think surfing, the surfing uh, was the origin of it all, especially when it kind of tied into skating. Cause when surfers weren't surfing, they were skating a lot of the time. So there's, there was always posers that were kind of out and about and they purport to be something that they're not. And I think that you got to be really careful with, um, who you surround yourself with. I mean, I've always said this guys, you got to be super careful with who you surround yourself with. Steve made a funny comment up here about the Varney, uh, guys, um, on the, you know, on the ski slopes, there'd always be these guys that wouldn't ski, but they had the full outfit on. It's a very expensive outfit and the Varney sunglasses and all that shit, but they couldn't ski for crap. You would never see them anyway. But um, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Now, I haven't seen these people in my 20s, and my 30s. It's only when I started doing this YouTube channel stuff and then it started to grow and it got bigger and I was talking about, uh, you know, basically making my wounds my work, which is really how this whole thing pivoted. And then for some reason, I kind of tripped into this space. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to solve any kind of like most guys that find uh, places on YouTube or even this thing they call the Mano Swamp. I'm going to call it the Mano Swamp because that's really what it is. It's a swamp. Um, they go, you know, they end up there because they're looking to solve their uh, reproductive issues, more specifically because they're trying to get the girls, you know. Um, it's kind of an ongoing process crack that Aaron Cleary and I uh, have used. I even titled one of the chapters in my book, How to Get the Girls, to kind of ride off on that a little bit more to, to build on it, um, if you're unfamiliar with the origin of it. But never happened in my 20s. You know, I was in the credit collection world for almost 10, 11 years, I think, and um, did really well, you know, went up through the ranks uh, awful quickly. We used to have this uh, avatar that, that we used to use with... Um, guys that were, we used to call them telephone tough guys. So if you're not familiar in the credit collection worlds, um, people aren't that keen on getting, you know, phone calls about paying their bills. And in some cases they would be threatening, you know, uh, when I come down there and rip off your head and crap down your throat and all this sort of stuff. And these telephone tough guys would run their mouths on the phone. Of course they're in debt, you know, so <laughs> they're not masters of uh, finances to begin with, but they would run their mouths on the, the phone and every single time they would show up politely, quietly, hand over the, the money, the draft, post it to checks, whatever it is that they were dropping off and walk away. There's no conflict, no fight. It was all hot air. It was all talk. Posers, right? Okay. Well, that's one time that I've seen it. I didn't see it once. My entire time I was, yeah, that's that's a good point, uh, Conk. Kong says, telephone tough guy is a precursor to keyboard warrior. Same sort of thing. Um, I remember when uh, forums started to become popular, uh, th there was one in, in the mid-2000s uh, that I was using in the credit and collection world. And there was always these keyboard warriors. And, you know, we used to joke and say that all you need is an internet connection and a computer, and you too can be an expert <laughs> on the topic too. Faceless, no idea who they are, made up avatar names, have no idea about their origin what's behind it. And it's very difficult to assess them. Sometimes, you know, a lot of them were, you know, huge posers too. Uh, what do you got there, Omni? 
Thanks for, well, okay, so ch channel membership. Um, Omni says, hey, Mr. Cooper, I paid the live chat free because I truly want you to know that you're appreciated, both your words and experience. I'm listening and taking notes. Good, man, thanks, appreciate it. Listen, I get a lot of love from you guys, emails, DMs, I you know, appreciate the support, whatever super chats, all that kind of stuff, it's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I know the impact is there. Uh, there's 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 no question in my mind. Um, don't, don't worry about that. Um, so, Moving on to the 30s when I switched over to entrepreneurship. So I took a package and I went home. I talked a little bit about it in my book as well, but I took a package, went home at about 30. And what do I do? I set up my own business, kind of tied into what I had learned and where I saw an opportunity. It was like that whole like luck preparation opportunity all kind of collides and meets in one spot and something big came out of it. Okay, so now I've gone from, you know, $100,000, $120,000 a year employee to writing my own paycheck within, I'm going to say within the first year, things were great. Within five years, we were in hyper growth, right? Um, within about the sixth year, I think we were doing like $300,000 a month. So by that point, we, we meaning like the business itself and me had, had qualified to enter into entrepreneurs org. And if you don't know what that is, it's a global organization that helps facilitate the growth of entrepreneurs personally and in their business. And one of the really, really nice parts of that is you get to get involved into these groups called forums where you meet privately with usually seven to 10 uh, guys. Sometimes there's a couple of gals in a forum, but it's mostly men. And, um, you know, you help each other level up. There's retreats, there's global events, there's national events, uh, really just like top shelf guys. You know, I always tell you guys, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room, get out of the room, move into a better room, right? So if you find yourself sitting around, you're like, there's a lot of dumb people in here and you know, they're like anchors sort of thing. You want to get out of that room and move and put yourself in a better place. Um, if you're sitting around posers, you're definitely in the wrong room. So EO becomes a thing for me. Um, I start doing the EOA stuff, which is basically mentoring uh, startup entrepreneurs, which were somewhere between 250000 a year plus uh, up to about a million dollars a year in sales. And then what we try to do is we get them up over a million dollars to graduate them to EO, which is over a million dollars in annual sales. So I'm around all these people and a weird thing happened that I that I kind of reflected back on just now in the last week when I was kind of prepping for this, because uh, every week I got to come up with a topic, right? It's it's kind of the thing with before the train wreck. I'm, I'm like, okay, so what sort of stories can we talk about? What lessons can we share with, with guys and gals out there that don't want to make mistakes in their life, right? So there's not a single person that spend any of their time in that area like the telephone tough guys were gone. They were a thing of the past. After that, there was not a single person around me that was disparaging, was a poser, was a clout chaser, was a fraud. Not one for years. These were guys that were, I mean, some of the guys in my forum personally, uh, a guy that got wiped out in a hurricane because uh, he was working in an accounting firm in uh, the Cayman Islands said, fuck it. And then he started to summit the seven peaks on all seven continents. So this is a guy that walked up seven mountains, the tallest peaks in the world, comes back and then sets up a highly successful chain um, of daycare centers. Uh, another guy that built one, of, I think it was the second or third, probably the second biggest toy company in the world, um, or sorry, North America, because um, there was a lot of Asian suppliers that retired in that too. So I forgot about that. But uh, large nonprofit organizations, like in the top three in, in Canada, like, like these are all highly successful people and they spent none of their time, none of their time whatsoever being posers, disparaging others, trying to bring other people down, making up stuff about them. They were on their purpose, right? Like they were chasing excellence. They were doing something of importance and significance. 